Welcome to the Higher Self Podcast. The purpose of this podcast is to help you unravel anything keeping you from a life of true abundance, joy, and happiness, which is your birthright. Each week, we'll bring in different guests specifically tailored to help you on your journey to discovering your higher self, whether it's spirituality, business, finances, health, or relationships, there are no topics that are off limits. So get ready and enjoy this week's episode of The Higher Self. Microdosing. This is a big word. This is a big topic. What is it like? How often? Um, why should you do it? Why should you consider it? This is something that a lot of people want to know about. And I got to tell you, there is no person on the planet that is better to be discussing microdosing, which is the focus of this week's episode of The Higher Self. Welcome, Paul Austin. How are you, my friend? Thank you for having me on the show, Danny. I'm fantastic. It's good to be in Texas. It's a little hot, but... Uh, a little I'm, is an understatement. <laughs> I'm grateful to be in your uh, incredible home and talking about microdosing. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. So let's dive in. Uh, first off, we met um, via um, um, some journeys that we had with plant medicine mm -hmm. and an organization that kind of connected us in. Mm -hmm. And I, I first have to start, like, you don't grow up, you know, saying to yourself, someday I'm going to teach people how to microdose, right? right? Yeah. How did this all happen? Like what happened in your life that caused you to even want to start working with plant medicine? That's a great opener. So uh, when I was 16, I was starting to work with cannabis a little bit. It was really the first drug, plant medicine, even slightly psychedelic substance that I that I found myself working with, which I think is, you know, quite common. Sure. And my parents soon found out that I had been smoking weed. And I grew up in a pretty, let's say, traditional family. We went to church every Sunday. You know, my dad worked at a Christian college. My mom's a social worker, right? Uh, morality determined by the Christian church and the law. So anything that's illegal is sort of off the table. And my parents, you know, had grew, grown up in a generation where drugs were bad and, you know, they're going to fry your brain and, you know, they're super harmful and all these sorts of things. So my dad sits me down after church one Sunday after they had found out and says, you know, I, I haven't been this disappointed since my brother passed away in a car accident 20 years ago. Oh, that was rough. Super rough. So, you know, I, I take that in. I'm like, you know, oh my gosh. I start crying storm out of the home, go elsewhere, you know, walk it off, come back. And, you know, the big takeaway was, as I've reflected on this over many, many years, clearly my parents, you know, they were just conditioned by the structure and the system that they had been raised in. You know, I can't blame them 100%. For, for that. And so over the next few years, I started to delve more into LSD and psilocybin mushrooms. And I was 19 and 20 in college, had these incredible, beautiful experiences with higher doses of psychedelics. And those really helped me to heal from the shame and guilt that I had been raised in around drugs are bad and you're doing drugs and how could you and all this sort of stuff that had been, you know, that I had taken on. And so through that process of healing that guilt and shame, I'm like, you know, I started to become this really, this person who really believed in my sovereignty and really believed that I could create anything that I wanted. And so at the age of 21, I moved abroad. Uh, I went to uh, Turkey where I taught English for a year. Soon after that, I moved to Thailand where I started my first online business. And around that time in 2015, I noticed that more and more folks were starting to talk about psychedelics. Mm -hmm. uh, so you had the Tim Ferriss podcast, you had Joe Rogan, there was more research coming out of places like NYU and Johns Hopkins. You know, cannabis was becoming more legally available in a lot of states. And so, you know, I was like, you know, there seems to be something here, like people are becoming more interested in this. And yet it's still, you know, in 2015, highly stigmatized, not a lot of education out there. And as someone who loves to learn and loves education, I thought how cool would it be to start a platform to teach people how to work with psychedelics in an intentional and responsible way so that, you know, we could shift this conversation around plant medicines, we could help to destigmatize them. And people could actually have access to a tool that could help them go through the same process that I went through, which is healing, Absolutely. you know, healing from guilt and shame, healing from trauma, healing from challenges and issues, and also transforming and really becoming a better leader, a better communicator, an entrepreneur. And so Third Wave was started in 2015. Um, and over the past eight years, you know, it just has continued to grow and develop 
as a platform. And the reason I focus so much on microdosing is because my mission has always been the cultural integration of plant medicines, of psychedelic substances, that people need to be able to have access to these, that they need to be able to utilize them in safe and responsible ways. And that, you know, the vast majority of people, especially when they start on this path, they're not necessarily going to go to Costa Rica and drink ayahuasca for right. a week, right? right? They really want to start at something that's a lot start more slow. accessible, uh, that's easy to integrate. And so I thought microdosing is the perfect on-ramp to starting to work with these substances uh, because it's subtle, uh, it's not overwhelming. You can, you know, combine it with things like meditation, breath work, yoga, and so publicly, I've just continued to focus on microdosing, microdosing, microdosing as an entry point for people to work with this in, a, in an intentional way. I love that. Um, a lot to dive into. Yeah. First things first, I want to I wanna talk about the situation with your parents. Yeah. Um, because, you know, when we talk about healing, we, we have to talk about these, these moments and these, um, the, these pivotal moments with our parents where... You know, maybe we felt ashamed. You know, maybe we felt like we were wrong. Maybe we felt not free to be who it is that we wanted to be. And then we learned to adapt, right? And I, I, I want to honor you and your parents, you know, for the fact that you said, like, they were just doing what they were conditioned to do, you know? Um, and yet, at the same time, I want to tie it into the fact that many of our listeners are conditioned to be afraid of plant medicine. They're conditioned first and foremost by religion. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, religion has a as a has a powerful foothold on the mind of human beings. Um, and and the more and more that you journey, and the more and more that you heal, the more and more you realize why that is. You know, in its pr most profound essence, religion is based on fear, essentially, and it's based off keeping you in that energy of fear. You know, I gotta ask you. You know. Just talk to me when I say that, what comes up being that you were in a very, you know, religious family like I was, um, and uh, being that you had to work through releasing some of those energies from your life. And, and what was it like, Paul? I know it was like for me, but what was it like before and after? What did it feel like to be alive, basically? So church every Sunday, four hours a Sunday, you know, we would have the morning service, we would have the service that was after the morning service, then we'd have youth group in the evenings, right? And so I'm spending a lot of my time at church growing up. And usually like getting it cognitively, saying the prayer, singing the hymns, you know, somewhat participating, but never feeling like it was alive for me. Um, and so as a, as, a, as a curious person, as a seeker, as a thinker, you know, I started to veer more and more towards atheism. You know, when I'm you 16, did. 17, 18, my best friend in high school uh, happened to be an atheist uh, from a young age, which was rare where I grew up because everyone is going to church. Everyone's sort of in that bubble. And so he started to sort of explore and expose me to like, oh, maybe, you know, religions are just these propaganda machines that are brainwashing us for... Uh, you know, nefarious purposes. And I don't fully believe that's true, but that that's sort of the lens of, sure, of, sure. of that context. Sure. So, you know, I'm starting to really question everything. And then at the age of 19, when I'm full blown into atheism at this point, reading folks like Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens and even Sam Harris, um, you know, I start to work with LSD. And so from the age of 19 to 20 to 21, psychedelics actually reopened me to the fact that spirituality, God, mysticism is a real fundamental thing. And that the challenge with, let's say, traditional religion is that it's become so um, ossified, it's become so dead in a way where it's just the rituals, it's just the traditions, but there's no like vitality and aliveness to mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. That when I started to work with psychedelics and plant medicines, they helped me to see the legitimacy in a lot of the teachings of these mystical um, people like Jesus and Buddha and the Prophet Muhammad and all of these, you know, incredible uh, mystics and religious leaders. And also helped me to see how religion had then created a structure around it that initially meant well. Yeah. But that became corrupted by the sort of shadow side of of, of humans yeah. in, in a way. And so psychedelics helped me to remember 
that I within myself have this spark of divinity mm -hmm. and work through a lot of the the shame and the guilt that I had been, you know, raised within to actually go, oh, the pro like I like I always thought I was the problem, that I was the sinner, that I, you know, that I was the bad person, that I was doing these things that you know, wasn't approved of by my family, my church, my community, all these sorts of things. And then when I started to work with plant medicine, I came to realize that no, it's not necessarily me. It's like, it's the culture and the church that I was raised in. And that in remembering this divinity and remembering this power, I then have a capacity to all, to help other people wake up into that as well. Isn't, and, and isn't that the teaching of Jesus. And that, that's the teaching of Jesus. That's that the you, teaching of all spiritual leaders. That you embody right. these lessons, right? And that's why psychedelics are so helpful. And also, I think, just to balance this, why they can be very challenging at times, you know? And why you need a really good set and setting in a container because those downloads and those insights are not always easy to integrate. Um, and so, like... This path, while incredibly uh, effective and useful and it beautiful, also can be challenging because, like, in my case, I was really fortunate enough that my parents, irrespective of my beliefs, have always showered me with an incredible amount of love. Yeah. So there was never any, like, shaming or, or or guilt tripping around exploring going and traveling starting my own business even like questioning some of my beliefs they always loved me regardless and i know that for a lot of people especially who are leaving mormonism or leaving you know, you know other fundamentalist traditions there's not that same love you're, it, you're outcast you're outcast yeah right and so i think this speaks to the final point which is community you know, that working with psychedelics, that working with plant medicines, when people have community, when they can do that within community, then they feel supported into stepping into that new way of being, releasing the fear, releasing the shame, releasing the guilt, and being surrounded by other people who, who are on a similar path. And that's like, you know, with this podcast, with everything that you're building, I think that's the most beautiful aspect of what, you, what you're creating. It's people are going through this massive transition and they have an incredible community who is also walking that same path of exploration with them. It's so funny. I mean, I, I, I guess I, I could say this, um, you know, this last week we had what it, inner circles is my, is my program for, you know, um, for the, for the, the people who are ready to take it to the next level essentially. And, um, and we had our intensive and our intensive is a three day workshop, kind of like awaken, but only for members of inner circle. And um, we focus throughout the year, we have four of them, uh, health, finances, relationships, and spirituality. Mm -hmm. And the spirituality one, we're all going to a reunion to do a retreat together. Right. Um, this last one was on finances. And I'm sure you're aware of this, um, uh, but you know, money is truly, it's, it's energy and it's just a byproduct of your energy and the life that you live and the value that you offer to other people. And when you get to that place, like money no longer becomes an issue. Like it, it's all just handled. It's, 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 it's all just, you know, it's all just a, a, a byproduct of who you are. Mm -hmm. So the final day, you know, 33 of us uh, with seven guardians, beautiful numbers, good number. yeah. beautiful yeah. numbers, yeah. Uh, went through a deep meditation. Uh -huh. uh, I'll say that for, uh -huh. yeah, we went through a deep meditation. And, you know, it was just so beautiful to see that, how loving everybody is and supporting everybody is uh, together because we really are, it's like, a, it's like a family of people who want to have it all in life, right? And, uh, and you're right, I want to I wanna say, you know, thank you for that because you just helped me realize how powerful community really, really is, you know, and, and how powerful it can be in our journey, you know. I want to I wanna take it to another point now. Um, there, there's very few mentors and guides that I think point you back to you. Mm -hmm. You know, most of our um, uh, influencers and teachers, whatever, uh, underneath what they're teaching, they really need you to accept, admire, respect, and need them, right? Mm -hmm. And um, 
I think it's one of the beautiful things about Awaken that people love, but also, like I have to mention, Joe Dispenza. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm going to tell you why I bring this up, because there's always this debate. Like if I ever mention plant medicine on my socials, you know, there's a group of people that say, and, and rightfully so, because it's their belief that you don't need plant medicine to, you know, to evolve and like to connect, so forth and so on. Um, it is always curious to me that those are the exact group of people that have never tried it. Right. Right. It's it's like me saying skydiving sucks, but I've never tried skydiving. Right. Like, what if I try skydiving and I think it's the greatest thrill of my life, you know? And I remember going to a Joe Dispenza one week retreat. And I remember thinking there because the, the 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 small conversations amongst people were a lot of people were like, I had a hard time connecting, and I had a hard time connecting, and I had a hard time connecting. And you know what I thought? I thought, oh my God, imagine if everybody just took a little microdose. Mm -hmm. Just a little microdose, mm -hmm. you know? What is your thought? What is your thought about what I just said and about people who like, you know, you know, are against this and like what a small little microdose could do, you know. So there, are, there are many paths. Yeah, take to the, them to the same destination. Yeah, you know. So whether it's breath work, whether it's psychedelics, whether it's meditation, whether it's whatever. Now, like a couple interesting anecdotes, and then I'll, I'll then I'll open up further. There's an interesting book written like six years ago called "The Secret Drugs of Buddhism," which was all about how in the '60s and '70s, when you had all these meditation teachers who went to China and India and Thailand to learn meditation, they came back to the States and they taught meditation. Almost every single one without exception was opened up into the meditative path through psychedelics. So in the 60s, when it was much more commonly used, they were working with acid, they were working with mushrooms, it opened up them to this path. Now they integrated and stabilized through a deep meditation practice, but the opening, the, the initial transcendence of, oh my gosh, like this is what's possible, came through psychedelics. So, you know, the, the other metaphor that I often use, it's like transportation, right? Like, you know, if, to, to get here this morning, you live a little bit in the, in the outskirts of Austin. I took a car, right? It took me 45 minutes to get here from East Austin. Now, I could have walked, right? Walking would have taken me, I don't know, 10 hours. I could have taken a bike. Biking would have taken me maybe five hours. I could have taken a horse and a buggy as well, right? A horse and a buggy would have taken, I don't know, probably even longer. And so there's all of these technologies that we can utilize to get to places. Psychedelics are one of those technologies, right? They're a very intense technology, which again is why they need a safe container, a great set and setting, great facilitators, but they are a technology just like meditation, just like breath work, just like yoga, just like neurofeedback, just like float tanks, you know, there's all these other things. And what we love, I think both of us about psychedelics is we know that in the vast majority of cases, something's going to happen. Mm -hmm. If you take five grams of mushrooms, if you go and drink ayahuasca, on the rare case, I think about 10% of people are not responsive, but the vast majority of people are going to have an experience. There are certain people who sit in the cushion and meditate for years and never have that mystical experience or do breath work and never have that mystical experience, right? With psychedelics, you know, it's going to happen. And so a lot of the fear then is, oh man, if I open up that, that box, let's say Pandora's box, what's going to come out? What am I going to, you know, what emotions that I've repressed for 20 years am I going to have to look at? What childhood trauma that I experienced might I have to look at, right? That fear is legitimate. I think that fear should be respected. And, you know, one thing that I've learned over the last eight years as I've done a lot of work in this space is how to strike the balance between education and evangelicalism, right? Because psychedelics are also a tool that they are in a way like an initiation or a rite of passage. And so early on when I was having all of these beautiful experiences with psychedelics, I was like, you know, you got to do it and you got to do oh, it. That was me too. My mom's <laughs> got to do it and my dad's got to do it and my sister's got to do it and my yeah. friends from college got to do yeah, it. And I'm yeah. just like, you know, and, and that was a healthy tendency because I myself was changing and transforming and people could see it. And I think what I've learned over the years is like, let who you are be the lesson. Let who you are be the teacher. People know, you know, that I do psychedelics. I now know the educational aspect is important, which is why I started Third Wave and why we have a podcast and why we have our training program for coaches and practitioners. And like some folks have, they just have to come into it 
in their own time. And this gets to the point about microdosing, right? If someone only has two options, you, you can either not do psychedelics or you have to go, you know, do five grams of mushrooms. All in. The likelihood that they're going to choose to not do psychedelics is much higher. If you give them a third option, which is you could just take a microdose, do it a few times a week, you're not going to feel much. You might have a little more energy. You might notice that your mood changes a little bit. You're a little bit more positive. You're a little bit more grateful, but you're not going to have visions. You're not going to have this intense experience. Then, um, you know, they're going to be way more likely to start to step into the ring. Like the metaphor that I use is when we learned how to swim. Right. We didn't just jump in the deep end. Hopefully, you know, hopefully our parents just go, good luck. See you later. You know, they probably put inner tubes on us. They probably, you know, had us in the shallow end. We learned how to navigate that before they put us mm -hmm. in the deep end. And to bring this full circle from the story that I was talking about earlier, you know, my dad, who I told you, you know, when I was 16, said, it, you know, the most disappointed he had been. When Michael Pollan's book came out in 2018, we have this relationship where like, He'll send me a book to read and I'll read it and then I'll send him a book to read and he'll read it. And so I'm like, dad, this book came out and he had read some of Michael Pollan's other works. So I'm like, you got to read this book, How to Change Your Mind. He read it. He was like, all right, like I see, I finally see, you know, what you're up to. And he actually started to microdose. Get out of here. Had never smoked weed, has never been drunk, has never smoked, you know, a cigarette, like, but started to microdose because it's, you know, there's not going to be this big challenging right. experience that he might have to go through. And then about a year after that, he journeyed, he came to me and was Shut like, "Shut up, okay, I think, <laughs> okay, I think I'm ready. I'm ready to do this. And so that he had a journey. Awesome. So this is 13 years after that moment. And so we kind of had this full circle, like, you know, and now my parents are, you know, they're supportive. My mom sends me news articles, you know, wow. it's like super cute. They're like, we fully get it. One of my sisters has been starting to microdose as well to help with her, some, some, some anxiety that she has. So it's like, and again, like when I started Third Wave in 2015, 2016, I was much more like, you got to see this, you got to do this, you got to try it out. Once I stepped back and was like, you know, you can come into this when and if you're ready, there's no pressure. I'm here to support you if you need it. And they then felt safe enough to go, okay, I don't all of a sudden feel this you know, pressure to do it. And so they all came into it into their own time. And so I think that's the beautiful part about microdosing. It's like for these skeptics, for these people who are like, you don't need it. You don't. And like the fabric of reality is much richer if you work with mushrooms, if you work with ayahuasca. And like, there's something beautiful about meditation and breath work that what we call an endogenous experience coming from within but there's also this really ancient intelligence in ayahuasca and in psilocybin and in San Pedro that's, you know, millions of years old. And that ancient intelligence, that ancient plant, archaic intelligence, it's like when we humans have a symbiotic relationship with that, the lessons and the teachings and the learnings that, that come from that, it, I mean, it's unspeakable. It's, it's ineffable. It's like, it's so potent. So if you've been listening to my podcast for a while, you'll know that I'm a strong believer and advocate for plant medicine and its ability to awaken and heal the mind, body, and soul. It's a belief that is deeply rooted in my own personal experience with both ayahuasca and psilocybin mushrooms. And many of you for years have always asked me, you know, Danny, where do I go? Who can I trust? And there is only one place I would ever recommend or put my name behind, and that is Reunion. Reunion is a place where you could set yourself free from whatever is holding you back from living the life of your dreams. It's a beachfront, beautiful property that is in Costa Rica. And what I love about it is that it's not for profit. And this is the only thing that they focus on is the preservation and the safe utilization of these beautiful, wonderful medicines. And I only feel comfortable putting my name behind it because I am personal friends and have journeyed with some of the members of the facilitating team. Guys, I'm honored to have aligned myself with them to create the Higher Self Scholarship Fund. 
It's a fund whose purpose is in helping people who don't have the means to experience these medicines and yet have the desire to. And every time one of you books a retreat with Reunion, $100 from every booking is going to go into this fund and we will be sharing this money with people on a monthly and bi-monthly basis. So help me help others by using the code Danny Reunion when you go to register to experience your own life transformational journey. To find out more, go to reunionexperience.org and get ready. It's interesting. Um, ha- half of the time I'm, I'm, I'm trying to work with people to help them to meditate. And what I don't realize is that I have a unfair advantage because of my work with psychedelics. Right. Like I remember the days where people would tell me to meditate and I could not have my mind shut up. Paul, not even for two seconds. I just couldn't do it. And now I, I just drop in. I drop in. It might take me a minute or two, you know, depending on what's going on in my life. But eventually I'm just like, and I'm in. And it's because of that, because the channel has been open, you know? Um, so so this, this is really interesting. So, you know, in my journey, uh, it's so interesting how we're so different, by the way, uh-huh. right? Like, I'm not really like a, you're very educational. You're very, I can get, I'm not, I'm like, Let's fucking go. Yeah. Let's just let's just like dive into deep end, you know. And so and so I I started with with ayahuasca, you know, and then I I found mushrooms and I and I actually it's, it's so interesting because you just asked me before you said should we microdose and I was like nah I'm cool because for oh, me before we came on the before episode. before yeah, we yeah, did yeah. the episode well, because microdose? because yeah microdose? yeah because um you know it's because I find like I, f- f- it, with my relationship with plant medicine it's like I I go in uh-huh. I get the lessons and then. I'm kind of like, I'm cool with them, you know? And so I want to ask you this. What, what is microdosing? What is considered a microdose, right? And let's talk mushrooms, because that I think is the most popular thing to microdose with, right? The most popular and the most legal and the most accessible. Okay. You know, okay. because of how legal policy is quickly changing, you know? Like even through Third Wave, we sell a grow kit, which I know we had at your, uh, your yeah. event like a month or so ago, where people can just grow their own mushrooms. So I think... The mushroom is, what I say is the mushrooms are the medicine of the people and microdosing mushrooms is the way that most people are working with mushrooms. Right? And correct me if I'm wrong, but if ever anybody asks me about this stuff, <clears throat> I say you're not going to feel anything. You're not, but on the back end, what's happening is like your your brain is like being well. I'm happy to talk about that. Please, too, right? please, like, yeah. So yeah. so I'll just I'll get I'll give the like five minute let's do overview. It. And by the way, if folks like want to dive in more, I wrote a book on this called Mastering Microdosing. So if they really want like the full length of it, check out the book as well. And where do they get that? Uh, Amazon. Okay, Mastering Amazon. Microdosing. Mastering Microdosing. It's Perfect. like a deep dive into that. So uh, I'll provide a little context and then go into the the practicality. So microdosing only came on the scene like 12 years ago. Uh, This guy, Jim Fadiman, wrote a book called The Psychedelic Explorer's Guide. He had a chapter on microdosing. A few years later, talked about it on Tim Ferriss, like 2015, and that's when it started to take off. Before that point in time, a lot of people only, you know, they knew about just take a high dose and have a mystical experience, right? That was it. So a microdose is what I call a sub-intoxicating level of psychedelic. Uh, and what that means is it's a dose level that you take where you're ha- like, a, like we talked about before, there's no changes in, in vision. There's no changes in what you're hearing. There's, you know, you're not like seeing God, you're not getting massive downloads. Some people may feel a little bit like, and I, I, I like to not be too rigid about that. Some people may feel a little bit. Some people may not feel, you know, anything at all. But the core important aspect of microdosing is that it's not just a one time thing. Microdosing is about a protocol where you're doing it two or three times a week for, let's say, 30, a minimum of 30 days. A lot of folks go longer, 60 to 90 days with a clear intention and purpose behind it. Yeah. So a lot of folks who are microdosing, you know, are looking to get off Prozac or Zoloft or Lexapro, or they're looking to get off Vyvanse or Adderall or Ritalin, certain psychiatric medications. And like, disclaimer, if someone is listening to this and that's what they're interested in, always do so under the guidance of a medical professional because weaning off some of these psychiatric medications can be nightmarish and microdosing can help that. Um, but it's important to do so under the guidance of a medical professional. Other people like, you know, you and I, 
uh, you know, I love to microdose to help with meditation. So, you know, if someone's had a hard time starting a meditation practice, starting a microdosing protocol can help them to drop in a little bit easier so they can start to meditate more consistently. So what we emphasize with microdosing is that microdosing is not a magic pill. And the reason we emphasize that is because, again, coming back to conditioning, we have been so conditioned to take a pill and think that it's going to fix our issues. You know, that could be a typical psychiatric medication. It could also be certain supplements. Oh, if I take this, it's going to make me 100% better. Or I'll get buff. Right. Or I'll get, I'll get stronger. Or I'll have, you know, better sex drive or whatever else that might be. Yeah. And, and, and in some ways, that's true. Like, there is a physiological response. But with microdosing, it also requires what I call willful participation. There has to be a commitment. There has to be a willingness to change. There has to be a willingness to show up for yourself. You can't just take the microdose and go, okay, like this is going to do all that. You really have to be willing to show up and do the work, right? And when you do that, what's happening in the brain is psychedelics activate something called the 5-HT2A receptor, which is the serotonin receptor in the brain and in the gut. And so when you're taking a psychedelic, what's happening, especially a microdose consistently, is it's lowering inflammation in your body and in your brain. And when, you're, when you lower chronic inflammation, the body's natural physiological response to heal itself, to learn better, to adapt quicker, opens up. And so the brain, what's happening is the two hemispheres in the brain, the right and the left hemisphere, which are usually pretty disconnected, all of a sudden they're starting to communicate better, right? They're, they're starting to communicate across the hemispheres. So, so often, especially like for us type A people and founders and entrepreneurs, go, 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 go. We're very linear. We're very, you know, like we got to get this done. We got to do this. When we start to work with microdosing and even higher doses of psychedelics, it opens up that creative side. So all of a sudden, flow states become more accessible. Creativity really opens up. It's easier for us to learn and to adapt to new situations because on a neurobiological level, microdosing is helping with something called neuroplasticity, right? And when our brain becomes more plastic, it becomes more malleable, and it becomes, you know, we can just learn things quicker and, and grow faster and develop in a more accelerated pathway. And again, it really comes back to intention. What's your intention coming into that microdosing protocol? How do you want to change from day one to day 90? right? Who you are now versus who you want to become. Microdosing is a tool that can help you get there. And, you know, having a meditation practice, eating healthier, uh, moving more, working with a coach as part of this. So even as one of the, the offerings that we've started to roll out, we have this 90-day program where it's like, okay, you want to work with psychedelics? You want to work with, you know, a high dose of psilocybin and microdosing? Let's, um, let's pair you with a coach who can take you from day one to day 90, who knows psychedelics in and out, but also knows executive coaching, performance coaching to help bring you through that process. And what's key with microdosing is that the dose level is about a tenth of a regular dose. So a regular dose of mushrooms, it's going to be anywhere from three to four to five grams. With a microdose, it's usually, you know, people start at 50 milligrams go up to 100 milligrams. Some people, a microdose is 200 milligrams, 300 milligrams. It's always personal, right? Mm -hmm. And that's another thing to emphasize is that you only learn through experimentation and trial and error. And what we always emphasize with microdosing is to start low and go slow. You can always take more. You can't take less. Mm -hmm. So if you want to start to microdose, start at 50 milligrams, start at 100 milligrams, see how that feels, see you know, kind of observe how you feel as you're working with it. And then if you want to go up a little higher, 200 milligrams, 300 milligrams, maybe 400 milligrams, you're starting to get into the perceptible range. And now we're starting to get out of the microdose and into what I call a mini dose. And that's, you know, still useful to work with, but now you're starting to have a lot more emotions that might come up. Now you're starting to maybe venture into journey uh, territory, which requires a different set and setting. A lot of people who are microdosing are doing that within their everyday life. It's not like they have to set aside, you know, six hours to do it. Um, they can sort of weave it into their normal everyday routine. Um, with the caveat being, if you're brand new to this, you've never done mushrooms. If you 
do it the first time in a microdose, do it on a weekend, you know, take yeah, some yeah, time yeah. for yourself. But yeah. normally this is something that's integrated into an everyday routine. And, um, and just to emphasize again, it's a protocol. It's two to three times a week. You're looking at day one to day 60, day one to day 90. And to have support as part of that process, a coach or even a therapist that's supporting you is really important. I love that. And in your experience with microdosing, you know, I know that you spoke about the medications, but what other things can microdosing help with? So the range is is quite open because if like I look at microdosing as a tool for neuroplasticity, right? So neuroplasticity helps the brain to learn, adapt, change, and grow. So if you want to learn anything new, if you want to learn a new language, if you want to learn an instrument, if you want to learn you know, if you're, if you're reading business books, you want to learn how to start your own business. If you want to learn how to become a coach, right? Microdosing as part of that process is just going to help to accelerate the overall transformation. Um, a lot of people notice that microdosing helps with becoming more em empathic, becoming more compassionate. So we often talk about microdosing from a leadership perspective. Microdosing can help you become a better leader because you can drop in better. You can listen better. Right. You can empathize better. Yeah, relate right? to people. You better. can relate to yeah. people better because yeah. a lot of people will, you know, instead of like my early path with microdosing is, you know, I started a microdose in 2015, um, and mind you, I had been working with psychedelics at that point for about five years, higher doses because that's all I knew at that point right. in time, right? right? And I started to microdose for two core reasons. The first reason was to stop drinking alcohol as much. Because, you know, I was, I was 24 at the time. I was going to the bar. I was, you know, drinking beer, wine, sometimes mezcal, tequila to help with social anxiety. Because I was like, ah, I just want to connect with people. That's all I really knew at that point in time. And so I started to microdose because it helped me to still be open and connect. But I didn't have to drink alcohol to do it. And psychedelics are a way superior substance to sure. alcohol, right? So that was core reason number one was social anxiety. The other reason was flow, creativity. I was building my first business at the time, uh, which was a teaching English platform. I, I, the first business I sold in 2017, it was uh, you know I was teaching English online, I was doing courses, you know, YouTube, all that sort of stuff. And so microdosing just helped me to enter a flow state, helped me to focus better, helped me to be more creative. So I would often microdose first thing in the morning, and then I would set aside a two to three hour window of just focus, flow, creativity, get things done, brainstorm, strategy. And so it can also be really helpful with that. Other folks, you know, who are maybe a little older, who are in their 50s, 60s, 70s, they notice that microdosing is helping them with their memory. They notice that microdosing is helping them to just stay more alert and, and sort of proactive in their everyday. Uh, a lot of people are looking to microdose to help with other practices like breathwork, yoga, meditation. So a lot of people love to microdose with yoga. They notice that it just helps them get in their body easier. That would be dope. To be able to drop in. Yeah, that would be dope. You know, yeah. to, to really do that. And I think that is the, when I look at the biggest utility of microdosing, and if, you, if your listeners take one thing away from this episode, it's not just, I'm going to take a microdose and see what happens. I'm going to be intentional about combining a microdose with meditation, breath work, yoga, with a creative state, with a you know brainstorming session, combine microdosing with another thing, and it's just going to synergize and help that other thing become that much better. You know, uh, thank you so much for that clarification. Again, because of my natural tendency and because of who I am, I only know go all in. Right. It's, and, and then as a result, sometimes when I talk about this stuff, I can see now how, you know, some people might go, whoa, that's a lot, right? Where this is all I know, right? What I'm hearing you say is that, you know, maybe something that I haven't considered is the fact that whenever we are in ceremony, we open up the ceremony by telling people, hold the medicine to your third eye and send the medicine your intention, right? It's the same way with microdosing, mm -hmm. right? You're going to go on a 30-day regimen, you know, of taking two microdoses or three or whatever your regimen is per week. And it could be like, I'll be honest, I'm just going to say, I could use this for like, I want to get back into the state that I was in a year ago where like, you know, I wasn't overeating as much. Mm. I still, I, f I find myself overeating a little bit. And as a result, I'm putting on a little bit of weight, mm. you know? Mm. And I'm like, I've been in this state where I'm like having a hard time getting back to where I was. And I'm like, okay, Danny, come on. Like it's, it's time. So I could use this for this, right? Also my book, you know, right. 
sometimes I have a difficult time just sitting and just flowing and writing. Like as you were saying that, I was thinking, oh shit, I'll take a little microdose and just set aside two hours and block I'll, it off in your calendar. I'll, I'll be just, done with this book like that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Powerful. And, and, man. and what's interesting is physiologically, microdosing is also an appetite suppressant. So if you're like, you know, if people are overeating and that you're not bringing as much consciousness to it, you take a microdose, it's going to suppress your appetite. You can do something like intermittent fasting where you're like, okay, I'm going to take a microdose this morning and I'm just not going to eat till 1 p.m. or 2 p.m., right? And it'll help with that process. You can get into that flow state. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of different ways to navigate with microdosing. Intention's important. A protocol is important. Sure, sure. And then having some sort of coach or support can be really helpful, especially if you're brand new to this. You know, you're at this point quite experienced. Sure. You know, the way I always talk about psychedelics is psychedelics are a skill that we can cultivate. You're quite skillful at this because you've been working with psychedelics now for over five years. Mm -hmm. So you know the landscape, you know some of the different medicines, you know how they work with you. But for folks who are brand new to this, right? Like there's there could be certain emotions that come up. There could be certain challenges that come up. 100%. You know, and so to have a coach that can support you in your corner, I think is a really important part to, to emphasize. 100%. Hey guys, before you continue listening, I wanted to introduce you to the sponsor of this episode, Athletic Greens. I decided to give AG1 a try because I wanted a supplement that actually tastes great, boosts my energy and supports my immune system. Uh, especially for someone like myself that fasts all day, I take it in the morning before starting my day and it makes me feel incredible. It makes me feel like I'm doing something good for my body. It also helps me save an enormous amount of time and it makes my life so much easier with just one scoop in the morning. So it makes it a very seamless and easy daily habit for me. Just one serving of this stuff, AG1, supports my long-term gut health. It has 75 high quality vitamins in it, minerals, and whole food source ingredients. So if you're looking for a simple and cost-effective supplement routine, Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of their vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. So just go to athleticgreens.com backslash Danny. That's athleticgreens.com backslash Danny and go check it out today. Interesting. So I know we can't tell people where to get it. Yeah. Right? I mean, we could do whatever we want, but you know. sure. But 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 you sell a grow. <laughs> Folks, yeah. <laughs> text me on Signal. No, no. <laughs> but but um, <laughs> but um, there's a grow kit. There's a grow kit. Tell me about the grow kit. Let's and generally like sourcing because I think and yeah, even yeah, yeah, legal, yeah, yeah. legal landscape because a lot of your listeners probably don't, aren't even aware of what's legal, what's not, like sure. navigating that. So the grow kit, the mushroom grow kit, we started a couple years ago because we noticed that there were a lot of courses and programs out there that taught you how to grow mushrooms but didn't give you a kit to actually do it. So we're like, fuck it. What we're gonna do is we're just gonna send a grow kit to your home. It has everything you need except the actual spores, because that would be illegal for us to do. We can't combine the spores with the grow kit, but we send you all the websites and you can order spores and it comes On your around. own. Order Basically the spores separately. on yourself separately. So, got but, it. but our grow kit has a, a course that helps to walk you through how to inoculate it, you know, how to make sure that it's mold free, uh, how to take care of it. The grow kit fits in a drawer or your closet. And within four to six weeks, you'll have up to 100 grams of dried mushrooms nice which is enough to microdose for if you were to microdose every day for three years there would be enough mushrooms in that one mushroom grow kit to support you in that process so what we emphasize is first and foremost grow your own medicine you know be a sovereign individual don't ha don't feel like you have to be a reliant on like going you know to a downtown sketchy place yeah, someone lives in new right. york or whatever and buy mushrooms from someone that you've never met or, or don't really know, right? Like have the mushroom grow kit, work with it yourself. The other thing that we, we emphasize is uh, we have a sourcing guide. And so what we tell folks is the mushroom grow kit is the best first option, but there are a lot of different ways to source these substances now that Colorado has legalized it, Oregon has legalized mm. it. You know, a lot of cities like Oakland, Seattle, Detroit have decriminalized these medicines, meaning that they're accessible to the lowest priority for law enforcement. Uh, California actually has a bill that's going through the state assembly right now that's going to be on the governor's desk maybe within a month or two 
to legalize psilocybin as well. So legality is really opening up. And what's important to emphasize is, you know, having been in this space a long time, and I have a, not a brother-in-law, but my sister's boyfriend is best friends with the DEA agent. So I'm like, how does the DEA feel about psychedelics? And they're essentially like, we don't care about it. We're focusing on fentanyl. We're focusing on cocaine. We're focusing on harmful and addictive drugs that are having these really nasty negative side effects. So psilocybin, mushrooms, ayahuasca, psychedelics, we don't care about. And even a month ago, I was at the, the MAPS conference, which was this massive conference in Denver. 12,000 people came to the Denver Convention Center in, in downtown Denver. And there was a DE agent that, that spoke there and essentially was like, we know we've made a lot of mistakes and we're actually looking at how we change those. And psychedelics are one of those core things that now with all the research coming out about, about microdosing and about psychedelics, we're realizing they have medical potential and that they shouldn't be these schedule one substances. Wow. So there's a lot of changes happening right now. And the reason I communicate that, especially to your audience, is because, you know, I still think the biggest risk of psychedelics is the fact that they're illegal. Yeah, for sure. 100% is the fact that these substances are illegal is the biggest risk when working with them. And they're becoming more accessible and available. And growing mushrooms in the privacy of your own home is fully kosher. And so that's why we say, if you're going to work with this, grow your own mushrooms, have that grow kit and support yourself I love in that. that way. And how beautiful, you know, I, um, I mean, I have my source and it's, it's a friend of mine. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a brother of mine. So, um, uh, but if you didn't like how beautiful it would be to grow your own medicine you know what I'm saying? Like the very thing that is going to help heal you and you are the one that's doing it. Like, And it comes back to like, we, you have a relationship that you've established with it. There's like a symbiosis there. Mm -hmm, sure. You know, you're really taking care of it. A lot of people will say they'll, they'll sort of like send it good vibes. You know, mm -hmm. they grow their mushrooms with a lot of love and you've probably had some good mushrooms and you've probably had some bad mushrooms. And oftentimes the difference is how it's grown. Sure. And who it's grown by. And if the energetic frequency of the person who's growing that mushrooms is super clean and pure, those mushrooms are going to be way better than if it's yeah. grown by someone who's yeah. you know, like sketchy or a little right. off or right. whatever For it sure. is. So Absolutely. these these are sensitive things. We are sensitive beings. And so uh, you know, being able to grow your own own mushroom supply is is really, really important. So two questions for, for, for me personally, uh, sometimes I do this. Um, that's one of the benefits of hosting your own podcast. You meet cool people and you learn from them. Um, question number one, I fast every day. Yeah. Um, um, does, does, and, and I don't like taking in any calories during the day. Does a microdose, is it, does it have calories? A microdose would not interrupt a fasting state. In fact, it only, um, amplifies or accentuates the fasting state. And the reason for that is because I was mentioning before that microdoses and psychedelics are, um, they activate the serotonin system. Got it, got it, right? got it. 90% of your serotonin receptors are actually in your gut, right? And there's something called the vagus nerve that connects the gut to the brain. So when you're taking a microdose, it's actually first working in your gut. It's healing up the gut. It's helping that to really get synergized, reducing inflammation all across the body. And then it moves up in the brain to help with neuroplasticity. And so that because it's interacting with all the serotonin systems, uh, receptors in the gut, it's actually helping that fast. Uh, it's helping you to create more good endorphins that support for sure. uh, your physiological wellness. Beautiful. Thank you for that. Second question, if I wanted to like, let's say, do some microdosing prior to writing my book, let's say I have budgeted you know, from 10 in the morning till 12 in the, in the afternoon to write my book, when would I actually take the microdose? How does that work? Yeah. So when we look at like a daily ritual with microdosing, and again, let's stay focused on mushrooms right okay. now. Okay. Uh, a lot of people also microdose with LSD and LSD is a different, uh, it's a different thing. It's much more illegal. Uh, it's much more potent and it lasts a lot longer. So I think really emphasizing that if someone is new to this, to start with mushrooms is the best bet. And I and I also want to say something before we go any further. You know, I I I personally don't like using the word drugs when it comes to plant medicine because it's something that is it's grown. It's something right. that I I feel that 
God, source, the universe left for us here to help us discover who we who we really are. You know, the thing with LSD is that that is an actual like you you have to cook it or make it. It's a fully synthetic substance. Yeah, it's yeah. made from something called ergot, okay. which is a fungus that grows on rye, but it is a fully synthetic. Yeah, it. I mean. I don't want to get too much on a tangent. LSD is one of my favorite because it is like, especially really good LSD is pure love in crystal form. Like wow. it is incredible. And um, as a synthetic, it just comes with more risks and, and more potential challenges. So yeah. there's a way in which plant medicines almost through the, the, the gift of God have, you know, there's a certain intelligence that's baked into them. Mm -hmm. So you can't like, eat too much mushrooms. If you eat too many mushrooms, you just vomit and puke them up. And uh, they're much more balanced in that got way. It, got it, got it, got it. So, so when it comes to like a daily routine with psilocybin mushrooms, uh, let's say you get up at 7 a.m., you know, and usually what I like to do is I like to stretch a little bit. I like to meditate a little bit. I'll drink some electrolytes or water first thing in the morning. I try to wait maybe an hour, an hour and a half before I drink coffee or tea. Uh, and in between that, like when I get up and when I'm drinking coffee or tea, I'll take a microdose. And on my microdosing days, I will always do a bit of a longer meditation. So my normal meditation routine is I sit down in the cushion and maybe do like 15 or 20 minutes in the morning. If I microdose, I try to do between 20 and 30 minutes. And the reason for that is because when we're microdosing, there's more energy that's being created. Um, and meditation helps to balance that. So sometimes when people microdose, it's like, it's, it's a little too much. It's a little too much energy. It's a little too much that's moving through. Uh, they get, they can get sometimes distracted. It's hard for them to focus. So combining meditation or breath work or some sort of meditative practice it could be yoga as well with that microdose first thing in the morning is really going to help the body to absorb the medicine and ensure that as you go in, to work on that book, you're in a really centered state. Got it. Right. And so let's say you wake up at seven, you microdose on an empty stomach sure. at 7 30. Maybe you drink coffee or tea, you know, 30 minutes to an hour after that. Then I love to have a journaling practice because I'm starting to get that brain juice going. And then after that journaling practice, you know, I then might go ahead and step into working on the book. And when I'm working on a book, you know, two hours of no distractions. So I do my best if I'm working on a laptop. I use an app called Self Control, which allows me to block all websites that might be distracting for that two hour slot. I block email, I block social, I block news, I block everything. And I just have that two hour window where I allow myself to go in, not be judgmental, not try to be a perfectionist, and allow the medicine to move through me just to be in that flow state and see what comes out. Beautiful. I love that. And then how long do the effects of a microdose last typically? So psilocybin is about six hours in length. And so if you're microdosing, let's say around 8 a.m., uh, you can expect that to start to tail off around, let's say, 1 p.m., 2 p.m. And what some people will do is maybe around 1 p.m., 2 p.m., they'll take another microdose and that will continue to elongate throughout the day. I don't necessarily recommend that. Uh, especially for novices, for people who are brand new to this. I think it's better just like do it once in the morning, you know, have that as your experience um, and then take a day off, right? And then the next day, microdose again and then take a day off and the next day, microdose again. We all, I always emphasize that take a day off in between microdoses because with microdosing, there's short-term tolerance, meaning that when you take a microdose for 48 hours, if you take the same amount, it's not really going to do much, if anything at all. That medicine is still in your system. The brain is still working with it in a really beautiful way. So give it a day off. People notice that even the day after they take a microdose, their mood is still heightened. Mm. They're still a little bit more open. Like, you know, there are some downstream positive effects that happen from the microdose. And then, you know, day on, day off. Maybe do it for 60 days or 90 days. And then usually at the end of the protocol, let's say someone who's listening to this goes, okay, I'm going to do it for three months, a 90-day protocol, two, two to three times a week. Then I tell them, okay, after those 90 days, take a break, right? Take two weeks off, take three weeks off, take a month off, reset your baseline, evaluate how have I changed as a result of microdosing the last 90 days. And the reason for that is because 
we don't want to become dependent on this external thing. Again, coming sure. back to microdosing is not a magic pill. We don't want to believe that all of our power is actually in taking the medicine. The power is always in you. That's right. The medicine is just opening you up to that awareness. I like the metaphor of Dumbo's feather, right? When Dumbo, you know, the, the cartoon character learned how to fly, he thought it was because he had this feather alongside him. And then they took his feather away and he could still fly. That's right. Right? And so with microdosing and any psychedelics, it's like Dumbo's feather. It's teaching us to believe in ourselves. It's helping us to remember that we have that power within us and we don't want to give our power up to that external substance we want to work with it as an intelligence and at the end of the day like be sober have a month off have six weeks off have eight weeks off right like i'm sure you've talked about this on the podcast with journeys like now even with high dose journeys i might do it once every three months once every six months but the integration process is so important and that's the last thing that I'll, or one of the final things that I'll emphasize with microdosing is microdosing on its own is phenomenal uh, as a tool. If, you know, anyone who's listening to this is like, I'm only interested in microdosing. I don't necessarily want to go do ayahuasca or do a bunch of mushrooms. Great. Like, good on sure. you. That's a great way to work with it. And, you know, people who are going to a place like Reunion and doing a high dose mushroom experience. Oftentimes, microdosing as a tool for integration after that high-dose mushroom experience is really, really helpful because when we have that high-dose experience, that neuroplasticity really opens up, right? We're like, oh my gosh, I come back. I'm going to make all these changes. I'm going to eat better. I'm going to sleep more. I'm going to change relationships. I'm going to change my job. I'm going to do all these things. And what microdosing does is it allows that window of neuroplasticity to stay open for longer after a high-dose experience. Because oftentimes after a high dose experience, that afterglow might only last, you know, a week or two weeks or three weeks. And we then and then we notice, oh, I'm starting to fall back into some of my old habits, some of my mm -hmm. old ways mm -hmm. of being. When we microdose as a tool for integration, we often can have one month, two months, three months where that window stays open for even longer. And again, I'll emphasize at the end of that one month, two months, three months, take some time off, take a couple weeks, three weeks, four weeks off to reset your baseline and get a sense of, of what's working for you and, and what's not. Beautiful, I love that. How do people find out more about you and Third Wave and everything that you do? So with Third Wave, we're at thethirdwave.co. We send out a weekly newsletter. We also have a podcast, a psychedelic podcast, which I gotta get you on, Danny. Sure. At some point, we've been publishing that for about seven years, we've published over 200 episodes. Um, we also have, uh, as I mentioned before, a program for one-to-one -one coaching called Personalized Psychedelic Coaching. That's through the Psychedelic Coaching Institute. Uh, so third wave is uh, thethirdwave.co and the Psychedelic Coaching Institute is psychedeliccoaching.institute. So if anyone's listening to this, wants to work with one of our established practitioners, that's a great place to go. And then finally, for any coaches or practitioners who are listening to the podcast, uh, we also have a training program for mm. practitioners. It's a 10-month program where if you're an executive coach, uh, a health and wellness coach, a life and relationship coach, we bring you through a 10-month container where we teach you how you can weave psychedelics into your practice. And that is also at the Psychedelic Coaching Institute. So I'm sure you know, you'll have that. links for all of this and um, thethirdwave.co and psychedeliccoaching.institute. Uh, those are the two kind of core platforms where we're weaving this cultural ecosystem around microdosing and psychedelics. Beautiful. I love that. And for the most part, you are you were at the last Awaken. We're uh -huh. going to get you at Awaken so people can just come and meet you at the booth and come and meet me at the yeah. booth. Yeah. Come and talk with us, you know, like get in touch with us. And, you know, we're here really as a resource for people who are stepping into the space, who are pretty new to the space. Uh, we truly believe that um, psychedelics and the legalization, the cultural integration of psychedelics represent a tremendous positive shift for humanity. For sure. And we want to make sure that we support that process through education, through trainings, uh, through resources, because uh, psychedelics are useful, they're effective, and they require um, intention, and they require a really good set and setting and container. I love that. Thank you for being here, man. Thank you, Danny. Yeah. Microdosing. Wow. I think I might have to start micro dosing. <laughs> That's this week's episode of The Higher Self. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, as always, the third wave. Um, 
you'll, you'll see them at Awaken, come up and say hi to Paul and his team. Uh, and for those of you that want to take it a step further, you know, reunion in Costa Rica is best place on earth. We'll see you next week for another episode of The Higher Self. Thanks for watching this week's episode of The Higher Self. If you heard something in this week's episode that caused you to think maybe, just maybe, there was a higher potential for your life. Maybe there was a potential to earn and receive financial freedom, to attract the relationship of your dreams, or to improve your health. That's what we specialize in. We help wonderful human beings like yourself to unravel all of the limiting thoughts, feelings, and emotions that you've been living through so that you can finally tap into your life's truest potential. If you'd like to talk more about that, we invite you to join us on Instagram or Facebook and email us the word discover more. And when my team sees that, they will reach out to you, send you the details of how we could help you on your pathway to a life of abundance, fulfillment, and creating the absolute life of your dreams. Message us right now, the words discover more now on Instagram or Facebook, and we'll see you soon.